All right, good morning, everyone. All right, good morning to our students online as well. Uh, welcome to a new week. This is the last week of September. All right, God has been good. Let's just pray and uh, begin our session this morning. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us this new week and uh, another opportunity to come into your presence and just read and study your word. And even as we learn together, Lord, we, we just pray that you will speak to our hearts, you will minister to each of us, be with us throughout this week. Even as we learn different courses, uh, may your wisdom, your grace, and your presence lead us, Lord. Uh, we commit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. So last week we did chapter six, right? We completed chapter six. And uh, let's just briefly look at what we did last week. Uh, in chapter six, we looked at invite and pray, right? And the most important thing we looked at was the power of a single invitation, right? Andrew called his brother, Peter, right? And Peter became the leader of the church. John the Baptist said, Andrew, you, you go, right? Philip called Nathaniel. So a single invitation is also very powerful. Right? It doesn't have to be that we are inviting hundreds and thousands of people, but one single invitation is also powerful. Then we look at... Um, you know, sharing Jesus on the basis of trust. You build trust, people will trust in you. People will believe in what you say, right? Uh, then we look at some of the reasons why we don't uh, invite people. And you and I, as believers, must overcome those uh, you know, inhibitions or things that stop us from inviting people, right? And one of the main points that we looked at was, you know, sometimes Monday to Friday, we are somebody else. Saturday is the Sunday, is somebody else. So very important, be who you are, wherever you are. Inside the church, outside the church, on the pulpit, wherever you are, be whoever you are. You don't have to put up a show, don't have to prove something, don't have to uh, you know, do something so that people will recognize. There's no value in that, right? So let's go into the next chapter. Everyone OK? Connect and impact, right? Now, as we look at ministry and as we look at reaching out to people, it's very important to connect with people, right? Why is that connect important? Because when we connect with people is when you will begin to build a relationship, right? Now, day one of your Bible college, did you connect with everyone? No. It's a, is he, everyone are just sitting quietly, minding their own business, right? And then two weeks is over. What happens? You build a connect. One month is over, two months is over. Then what happens? Either you really like each other or you really don't like each other. One of those two. But you built a connect, right? There's a connect that's happened. A relationship has been built. Right? So when we are ministering to people, we must look to connect with people, connect with them on their own level. Right? And some of them are very high. Some of them are just trying to understand. Some of them don't know anything. Connect with them on their level. Right? So some of the things that we do you know, as a church is sometimes we get into... All right. So sometimes we get into, uh, you know, we go into missions, right? We go into North India. Most of you are in North India, from North India. And when we go there, we cannot talk in a very high understanding, right? Because we have to relate with the people there. Many of them are from villages. They, I can't keep talking about revelations, what the Old Testament said, you know, this is the offerings, the sacrifice. All that is important. But you have to connect with them. You have two days in the conference or three days. You have to be able to connect with them on their understanding. Then there are times we go for pastors' meetings, pastors' conferences. So we try to connect. The topics are more connected towards pastoral, right? how to build a church, 
how to uh, you know build teams within the church how to look at church growth what are the methods of church growth all of these things right so when we connect with people make sure you're connecting on their level right don't go and talk a different language meaning imagine i come here and i talk french you'll all be sitting and listening nothing will go in why there's no connect now let's look at the best example in john chapter 4 jesus has just begun his ministry right john chapter 4 he's just begun his ministry he's formed a team now he's going to a certain place right now as he's going to this place we know the story of the samaritan woman right jesus goes to he's passing by through samaria now let's let's look at a few verses here okay mm. Chapter 4, let's read from 1 onwards, and I'll stop you in between if I want to just explain something. Yes, any one of us can read John chapter 4, verse 1 onwards, and in between, if I, if I request you to stop, please. Can you read, Pastor? Yes, please go ahead, Gertrude. Yeah. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sichar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who is it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Then the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Yes, uh, Gertrude, we'll just pause here. Okay, now you see how the Lord Jesus is, you know, divinely set up this appointment, right? Now, Jesus is going from Judea to Galilee, to his hometown, right? Now, he has to pass through Samaria. Everyone know about Samaria, right? Now, what's the background about Samaria is the Samaritans were mixed culture. So, for example, they they used to worship idols, and now they got married to Jews, right? So there was mixed. So, for example, the husband is a Jew, wife is a Samaritan. The wife is a Jew, husband is a Samaritan. So what's happening is they are a mixed culture. On Sabbath day, they'll go to the Jewish temple. They'll do everything what God told but they also go to the mountain and worship false gods. They do both. So the problem now is the Jews hated them. So these Samaritans are the worst people. You know, uh, they had so much of hatred that they will not pass by that area, Sam Samaria. They will go all the way around because they don't want to breathe the air of the Samaritans. They were treated like scum, meaning they are nothing. They have defiled God. 
God is so holy. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These people are worshipping that God. And then they're going to the mountain and worshipping idols also. They should not even involve with us. They should not even talk to us. So there was an extreme hatred between Jews and Samaria, the Samaritans. You understood this? Right? Because of the mixed culture. Right? There was extreme hatred. They didn't like each other. They didn't talk to each other. They hated the practices. So the Jews will stay away. I will not talk to this. If they see a Samaritan, they will turn their head and walk away. They will not even go close to them. There's so, so much of hatred for them. Now Jesus has decided he will go to Galilee and he purposely goes through Samaria. Now, two things. In the Old Testament, women were considered as people who would work at home. Right? They, they had to work at home, be at home. And the men were considered people who would go work out on the fields or whatever their work is, they'd come and provide for the house. So women were not given importance in the Old Covenant, right? not much of importance. And now Jesus is going through Samaria. And let's read the verse there. I'll just keep reading, right? So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot around Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And verse 7, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Now, a Samaritan woman came in the afternoon. In the afternoon, nobody is there outside. Right? She chose her timing. She said, okay, afternoon time, nobody will be there. So I can go out and fill water. Because you don't want to be seen by people. Right? So she's there, she's filling water. Who starts the conversation? Did, did she start the conversation or did Jesus start the conversation? Jesus, what did he say? Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink of water? Remember, ask the right questions. Remember we did that chapter? Ask the right questions at the right time. Jesus didn't ask, are you Samaritan? Now she would have said, obviously I'm a Samaritan, I'm from here. But Jesus asked the right question. Will you give me some water? There's no big spiritual question there. Uh, Jesus didn't say, behold, I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. And today you are seeing the Messiah. So now I want some water. Okay, will you give me some water? Now, why did Jesus ask that? He was thirsty. But it became a point where he began the conversation. Now, what is it that we must take from this conversation, this, this portion, right? The, this opportunity to meet the Samaritan woman was a divine setup by God. God, does God know everything? Yes or no? He knows everything. So God knew, the Lord Jesus knew that he is going to go, he's going to meet this person and he's going to talk and have a conversation and through this person, the city is going to be saved, right? Be ready for divine setups that God has arranged for you and me. For example, you go back home during the break of Bible college, and then you, you're there, you're serving in the church, or you're just outside meeting your friends, and you see a friend who, was, who you met five years back in school. What will you do? Think of it as a divine setup. Right? Yeah, you can talk about what all happened in school. Hey, remember that teacher, remember this teacher. Uh, but think of it as a divine setup. So what can you do? Hey, you know what? I've, come, I've become a student again. Where? In Bangalore. What are you doing in Bangalore? Bible college. What is that Bible college? Gives you an opportunity. Bible college is a place where I learn about the Bible. What is the Bible? What's there? Oh, this is about Jesus. Yes. What's happened? Simple divine connection has happened. You're talking about your school, and now you've led that conversation by saying, hey, now I'm still a student. They may be working, but you're saying, hey, I'm still a student. And they'll ask, why? why? Why are you a student still? I'm, I'm here. I'm studying in Bangalore. And then it gives you an opportunity. right? Now, look at the Lord Jesus, right? 
he had many reasons not to talk to the woman right he could have mind his own business saying i'm the messiah i'm jesus i have much more important work i have to go to uh, you know galilee i have to go home the disciples are there so much of work to get done ministry so much is there so fast let's go fast but jesus didn't do that look at what all he had over, he had to overcome right one he was tired how many of us get tired all of us right when we are tired do we like to talk hey leave me alone <laughs> don't talk to me i want to rest even when you're resting you say i don't want anybody to to, to talk to me i want just half an hour of peace now jesus is walking right and he's tired he could have just sat there relaxed but he decided to to take the step and ask the question who he was a jew and she was a samaritan i told you the background being a jew jesus is more superior than the samaritan the jews already hate the samaritan and thirdly not only that jesus was a man and this is a woman jesus could have thought hey i'm a jew and these are samaritans so i'm i'm not going to talk to them i'll wait for a jew to come and give me some water if it was any other jew they wouldn't have asked they wouldn't have asked he said no i will i'll remain thirsty if i have to faint also i'll faint but i will not ask water from a samaritan but jesus did it he overcame those limitations those you know those barriers that we put on each other he overcame it he said no for jesus she was just another person who god can use right and thirdly was he's a man she's a woman what about my prestige what about my reputation what do people say what if i'm talking and the disciples you know the disciples have gone for get some food what if i'm talking and the disciples see me what will happen or what if some jews come and they see me talking to a samaritan woman what explanation i can give them no. he didn't think about all that for him it was a divine setup god has orchestrated this and he and he went ahead and did what he had to do jesus laid aside inhibitions you know we talked about inhibitions that means things that stop us from sharing to people one let's look at a few of them he lived to do the will of the father and complete the work of his father let's read john 434 john chapter 4 verse 34 that same verse okay i'll read it 34 my food said jesus is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work now the context is the disciples came back and said ah oh, we got some food jesus we have some food we all can eat now but jesus says my will is to do my food is to do the will of the father right did jesus eat after that he must have ate but he was trying to explain something the reason i am coming here the reason i'm talking to this woman the reason that you all are surprised that i'm talking to a samaritan and a woman you know if you read go on and read we'll continue to read it says that the disciples were surprised to see jesus talk to a samaritan but they kept quiet they didn't question jesus let's read from there on uh, okay tw verse 21 i'll read verse 21 right Oh, sorry from verse 19 let's read the woman said i can see that you are a prophet our fathers worshiped on this mountain see so she's a samaritan woman she's saying our fathers worshiped on the mountain there was a idol there probably right mount gerizim they would go there and worship on this mountain right but the jews claim that the place where we must worship is in jerusalem so you understand what's happening here she's saying one group of us we worship on the mountain but the jews are saying right we have to go to jerusalem right and worship god in the main temple but they will not allow us now look look at jesus's response right jesus declared 
believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Now, the, the Samaritan is talking practical things. She's saying, some of them go to the mountain, worship. Some of them say, go to Jerusalem. Jesus is saying, there will come a time you don't have to go to the mountain, you don't have to go to Jerusalem also. He continues on, powerful. Jesus declared, Your, you Samaritan women worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. This, these three lines would have changed her thinking so much. It would have touched her. See, if she goes to the mountain and worships, that's good. But she can't go to Jerusalem. She probably wanted to go, but she can't go. Now, Jesus is saying, there'll come a time, it's not about the place. It's not about whether you're in the mountain or in the valley. You will worship wherever you are, you will worship in spirit and in truth. So now the woman is thinking, what kind of place is this? What is this spirit? What is this truth? You see what's happening? God, the Lord Jesus has put something. Now I'm sure there are questions in her mind. What does Jesus do after that? The woman said, I know that the Messiah, which is Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. So the woman is saying, I know about the Jewish traditions. I know that the Jews are waiting for a Messiah. And when he comes, he will explain everything. So you see what's happening here? This woman knows both the Samaritan culture, the Jewish culture. Jesus says, I'm the one, I'm the Messiah that you're, you're talking to. Look at verse 27. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. You see what's happening here? Jesus is talking. The disciples come back. They see Jesus. I can only picture the disciples. The disciples are talking. Is that Jesus? What is he doing there? He's talking to a Samaritan. Oh, no, no, no. You should not talk to a Samaritan. And that is not only a Samaritan. That's a Samaritan woman. The disciples are thinking what to do. But they know Jesus. I can't question Jesus. So they go to Jesus. They're just standing there. They're not asking anything. Jesus also is not saying anything. Everything is done. Jesus has the encounter with the Samaritan woman. They go. Right? So what is it that we can learn here? Few things. Every person is harvestable. That means every person can be reached. There is no person, whether, you know, we talked about it, right? Every person in this world needs a savior. Whether they are the richest or the poorest, whether they know English, they know how to read, they know how to write. It doesn't matter. Every person is harvestable. Who would have thought that this Samaritan woman, God will use this Samaritan woman to share with the people in the city about the Messiah? Who would have thought? When we think, we would have thought, oh, we have to choose a person who can speak well, who knows how to dress up well, can talk well, who can communicate well, who has a good respect in society. Did she have respect in society? She had five husbands and the one she's staying with is not even her husband. You think people didn't mock her, made fun of her, ridicule her? They would have spoken bad about her. But now God used that woman to make the gospel go around the city. Right? So whatever failures we have, whatever baggage we carry, no, I'm not good in this, I'm not good in that, I'm not good in this. Whatever we carry, God is able to go above that. Right? Remember when uh, 
you know, when uh, Samuel was, God told Samuel, go to the house of Jesse and anoint the next king of Israel. Right? What happens? All the fellows, all the brothers are standing there with army fellows, right? strong and mighty warriors in the army of Israel. And Samuel is saying, maybe this person is the right person. Maybe this person is right. He's, he's strong. He can lead the nation of Israel. And then he goes to one brother, one brother, each brother. No. And Samuel asks, is there anybody else? Ah, there's one fellow. He's in the field. He's looking after the sheep. Don't worry about him. He's only a small boy. He's looking after the sheep. Now, all these are the, already in the army. Samuel says, go bring that boy and come. The boy came. And the Lord said, anoint him as the next king of Israel. It doesn't make sense. Think of it. These brothers are already in the army. They already have experience. All they need to do is learn little more, become the king. Now God is saying, no, I don't choose any of them. I'm choosing somebody with no experience. He's in the field. But without experience, he has killed the lion, he's killed the bear. And he's, he honors me as God. Man looks at the outward appearance. Outwardly what we can do. God looks at the... So that is the attitude that we must carry. We must not carry an attitude by looking at a person and judging them. Saying, hey, this person can't do or that person can't do. No. Man looks at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Look at what a person can be. Look at what, if God opens a door for you in prison ministry, right? Now it's very difficult, right? Because you know they've done, they done something wrong and they're in prison. They could have murdered somebody. They, may, they could have stolen something. But prison ministry, if you're going to minister to them, we cannot be judging them and going. We need to look at them at how God looks at them. There's a pastor that I know in Mumbai, and he always does ministry with, in the red light area, right, among prostitutes. And many years back, I got the opportunity to go, and I saw the, the living there, how they are, very hurtful, very painful. Many of them have been forced into it. And, you know, it's very easy to judge them. Oh, you're like this, you're defiling your body. And, you know, because you know, this is sexually immoral, God will punish you. Very easy to look at it that way. But if you look at it the other way, God can change them. They also are human beings. They also have a heart. They, they, they probably went through, the, you know, many of them, 95% of them, uh, of these girls were probably abandoned, found in dustbins. Or these girls, you know, have been uh, just, they ran away from home because of sexually abusive parents, many things. It's not like they want to do it. Sometimes they're forced into it. God is able to change their lives. You know, when we had those, uh, we had a couple of meetings there, they all came in the line, they're standing for prayer. These are all prostitutes. Every person is harvestable. Right? It's very sad, but when we minister to them, never look at what they're doing. It may be the biggest sin. Look at what God can do. That's why Jesus said, no, don't look at the speck of wood in somebody else's eyes when you have a big piece of log of wood in your own eye. Yes or no? Right? In, in, there's a small dust in your eye. Wood piece is there. We're trying to take that out, but there's a big piece of wood inside our eye. Right? So always remember, every person is harvestable. We are gathering fruit for eternity. When we share the gospel with people, their lives are changed. There, there is fruit that is eternal. Look at the fruits around us, the plants and the trees. It's not eternal. One day it's all going to go away, right? Even what, what, are, what we do, our achievements, 
it's all going to go away one day right even if you become the biggest ceo of an organization that's good right but that's not going to bear eternal fruit eternal fruit is what you do in the kingdom of god now when you and i share the gospel when you and i are ministering and serving in the church that is eternal fruit and that fruit will not nobody can take it from you nobody can say hey this is mine i did it no god will say no it's not yours this person's fruit because god is the judge he will give according to, accordingly to each one what they have done sometimes we sow and the other person reaps very important right what is you we all understand the concept of sowing right everyone i've seen farmers right they sow the seed then what they do they water it then what do they do the, as the crops grow they have to check they have to put pesticides they have to make sure that the weeds in between don't you know pull down the crop so there's a lot of work so god is saying sometimes we sow the seed somebody else will water the seed somebody else will bring correction rebuke exhortation and then somebody else will bear the fruit let me give you an example picture this there's a young boy 20 years old boy or girl anyone okay. 20 years old and this boy just become a believer right somebody has shared with him the gospel and he's become a believer somebody has sowed the seed now after becoming a believer what should happen there should the seed has gone and the seed should bear fruit now now from this place he'll go to another city he goes to another city to find a job and he gets connected to a church and in this church he's being watered he's listening to the word of god he's joining a cell group every sunday he's serving in the church so what's happening he's the, the seed of god's word is growing now after three years he goes to another city because he got a job in another place he goes there right and now he's in a place of ministering to others so he goes to a local church he begins to serve and then he takes on leadership he becomes a youth leader right and from a youth leader he becomes associate youth pastor then he becomes youth pastor then he becomes a pastor now the fruit is being borne by somebody else but the seed was sown when he was 20 years old one man will sow another man waters another man reaps so we must never look at it's it's wonderful when we see you know so you know people who have uh, you know we share the gospel they become believers and in front of our own eyes they grow up they become leaders and pastors that is beautiful to see but not always that happens sometimes we'll have to sow sometimes we'll have to water right uh, people will come to us we have to teach them we have to train them right now each one of you when you go back to church during the break you'll have to water people in the church hey these are the things i learned these four months when I was in Bangalore, you know, people will ask you, hey, what did you learn in Bangalore? You're going to Bible college. So then you get opportunities to minister, get opportunities to teach and preach the word of God. Right? What are you doing? You're watering. Right? And eventually, you will also see the fruit. You know, when it is obvious that someone has sowed into this Samaritan woman's life, you know why? Because she says, no, I know that one day the Messiah will come. That means somebody has told her about Messiah, right? She has been thinking about how to worship God. Because she says, sometimes, you know, we worship in this mountain, but we have to also go to Jerusalem and worship. So she's thinking about it. It's not like her mind was blank. She's thinking about somebody has told her about all of this, right? And she was interested to find out who this Messiah was. Again, somebody has sown the seed. What did Jesus do? He just watered it. Oh, somebody told you about Messiah. I am that Messiah. Water the seed. Then what will she what she went out and did? Went out to the entire city, started sharing. 
the entire city people started believing in her word can you believe that if you think of it people started believing in her message she said come everyone come and see i've spoke to the messiah he told me everything about myself and they believed her word they didn't say who are you first of all you're uh, you know you're a woman secondly you're married five times oh, go back home and do your work they didn't say that they believed they all came you read the verse later on um, Many of the Samaritans, verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Just because the woman shared what happened, many Samaritans believed in Jesus. Right? He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed with them two days. And because of his words, many became believers. You see what happened? Remember that ripple effect we talked about? From 1 to 2 to 4 to 6, 8, 10. The best part is they believed in her word. When God chooses us, right? sometimes we'll be insignificant in the world. People will look and say, hey, what will this boy do? What will this girl do? Nothing. Probably if, if it was the disciples, they would have thought, what will this woman do? But Jesus didn't think that. He overcame that. He said, she can do many things. There are nine failures in her, but one good thing. What we do is we look at the nine failures. It's common, right? But what Jesus did was, he looked at that one area where she can be fruitful. And that's what Jesus does for all of us. We can have nine things going wrong in our life. But that one area where we are fruitful, God can use it and multiply it. Get what I'm saying? Right? Now, I'm not saying continue to you know, live in that nine areas of sin and failure. No, we correct that. But God is willing to use that one area where we can be fruitful. Look at this woman. Five husbands. The one you're staying with is not your husband. Samaritan. Who's going to listen to her? But they all listen. Right? What if she had gone back and just gone back to her room and said, Wow, I met the Messiah. And I better not tell anybody right now. Because nobody will nobody will believe me. But right? everyone will make fun of me if I share the gospel. If I share about Jesus, they'll make fun of me. That's not her response. She went on the roads telling, Come and see. I have met the Messiah, right? So there are things uh, that motivate us to help us break past our inhibitions, meaning to break past things that we are, we see that are hindrances to the gospel, right? Now, let me give you this example. In church history, there was this young man named uh, Robert Murray McShane, right, in, in the West. Now, he was a pastor. And for many years, he was praying for revival, saying, God, you bless this church. And let there be thousands of people coming to church. It was a small church, maybe about two, 300 people in his church. But he used to pray, God, bless this church. Let revival come in this church. He spent almost his entire life praying for revival. Right? But as every church, he saw church growth very small. Church was still going good good leader what happened was he took a break because he had an accident he took a break right he wanted to take some rest he was getting old as well so they chose one young person in the church his name is wc burns right one young person 26 year old boy said okay now you become the pastor of the church till you know till the main pastor comes you know gets well get some good rest and come back so you be the pastor of this church so he came Young boy, 26 years old, said, okay, what, 300, 400 people. He began to preach every Sunday, preaching and all the other activities. All of a sudden, hundreds of people started coming. 1,000, 2,000, 
three thousand. Now this boy doesn't know what he is doing. What he knows, he doesn't know. He is just. He is not doing uh, revival prayer, fasting, praying. Nothing. He is just come for you know because they said you preach some Sundays and he had some Bible uh, knowledge, so he's preaching. Thousands, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand, ten thousand people. How old is he? 26, 27 years old. He doesn't know how to handle. Maybe he's praying, God, you only 400 people. Why so many people are coming? He may be thinking his preaching is great, <laughs> but it's not that. You know, they wrote a letter to Robert Murray McShane. They said, something is happening here. Thousands of people are coming to church. He says, God has answered my prayers. But who saw the fruit? One boy who didn't know anything. Who probably didn't pray at all for revival. So one man sows, maybe another man reaps. Now I'm not saying when you start your ministry that uh, you know somebody else will come, but there are times God will send people. We cannot do ministry on our own. Right? We must tell ourselves that we need people, we need a team. We need to work together as a team to build a strong ministry. Right? And we learn more in the coming courses as well. Second, what Jesus did was he was able to connect with the disciples, sorry, with the, with the woman. What did he say? Give me a drink of water. She came there for what? To fill water. Jesus said, give me some water. Simple connect, right? Some things that we must be cautious about when you and I are engaging with people, right? Now, when we're engaging with people, we must be wise on how and where to engage with people. Okay? Now, for example, you're a pastor, right? And you're a youth pastor. And under you, you have many youth. So there are many boys and girls, right? So as you're ministering, be wise. As a male, be wise how you minister to girls. And as girls, be wise how you minister to boys. Right? We need to be wise. You need to, it's not, we're not saying don't talk to a boy, don't talk to a girl, but be wise because this is ministry. Right? Two, be careful not to interfere in personal matters. When you and I are ministering to people, don't interfere, don't, unless the person shares with us. Right? It's good, but don't interfere in personal matters. Right? So, for example, you see a couple, right? Don't say, Why you don't have any children? Don't go and ask. That is none of our business. Right? Why you don't have a car? Why you're not working? That's that's not our problem. That, that's not what we, we are to do. We are not to interfere in their personal matters. That's personal. Now, if they come and say, you know what. A couple comes and says, we're praying for two years. We haven't got a child. Can you please pray? That is different. You understand what I'm saying? Right? But you don't go and ask. Don't interfere into personal matters. Uh, you bought a house. Okay. So from where you got the money to buy a house? They don't ask all those questions. That doesn't, it's not our responsibility. Bought a house. Okay. God bless you. All the best. Do well. Pray for their house. Bless them. Release them. Don't interfere in personal matters. Now, this is where pastors do the wrong things. Not only here, all across our nation, especially I see this in happening in North India. And, uh, you know, why? Because they interfere. How much is this land? If I can you do this, can you do that? Interfering in marriage. No, you have to get your daughter married to this person. No. That is a family matter. You keep family aside, you keep ministry aside. Unless the family says, come and pray, pastor, do something, pray for us, then you can go. But don't interfere in people's personal matters. Do not be condemning or have a self-righteous attitude. That means don't feel like, hey, I am the pastor now, so I can talk whatever I want to talk. All you people, you don't know how to pray. That's why God is not uh, you know, working in your life. You don't have faith. That's why you're not receiving healing. So these are all the wrong ways of ministering to people.
right? Uh, you don't, your, God is not blessing you because you're not coming to church every Sunday. You're not coming, you're not serving in the church, you're not volunteering in church, so God will not give you anything. This is all condemning, acting like, you know, God has done everything for me and he'll not do anything for you. Self-righteous attitude, no. Remember that ministry is about serving others. We have to serve, not to condemn. Even when we are correcting people, we correct them. Right? God will bring situations where we have to correct people. But when we correct them, we correct them with love. There are times we have to be stern. Be stern. Right? It's for their benefit. But you're not interfering, you're not condemning them, you're not making them feel low. You get what I'm saying? Yes? Third one is to impact. As Jesus engaged with the woman, he released words of knowledge. Now, this woman did not say, you know, these one, two, three, four, five, these problems are, I have. But Jesus himself released words of knowledge. And the first thing that happened, the woman thought, how do you know this? How do you know that I'm feeling lonely? How do you know that I have five husbands and the one that I'm staying with is not my husband? How do you know that? I've not met you before. And that's why she goes on to say, I know you're a prophet. So when we connect with people, impact them with words of knowledge, prophetic word, pray for healing. Do you remember the power encounter approach? Pray for healing, pray for deliverance, pray, for, pray that God will bring a supernatural providence, right? Jesus did that. He met and believed the Lord on that same day. The gifts of the Spirit, as we are ministering, the gifts of the Spirit can be released to people. Right, And four is the ripple effect. Now, one woman was impacted. She went, shared the gospel with everyone. Everyone in the city became believers. What does it say there? Verse 20, 39. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Many believed. And they asked Jesus, Jesus, don't go. Stay back here. You teach us. You speak to us. And he stayed back for a few days, right? And he ministered to them. So we see a ripple effect. When we connect and impact, be ready for divine appointments. Be ready for divine setups. You're sitting in the train, for example, going back to your hometown for the, for the holidays, sitting in the train, and you have one person next to you. How many hours journey is the train? 24 hours, 48 hours, 60 hours, everything, all different places, right? Now you have 48 hours. Okay, take out sleep, everything. 20 hours you have. It is our opportunities that we can give. Now, I'm not saying that people will accept everything. There'll be times when people will be willing to hear, willing to listen. Next week, I'll share a few examples on you know, how we were able to share the gospel in, in a public setting, in trains and uh, bus and outreaches and all of that, and how God ministered, right? So next week, we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, thank you so much. Thank you to our online students. Have a good day.